Good evening to everyone here and all of those in Birmingham and Manchester watching via live stream. Uh, we're delighted and honoured to be addressed this evening by the Chief Rabbi, Lord Sachs. In his tenure as Chief Rabbi, Lord Sachs has been a visiting professor at several universities around the world and has received numerous prizes for his work, including the Jerusalem Prize in 1995 for his contribution to diaspora life. In 2005, he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen and made a life peer, taking his seat in the House of Lords in October 2009. The Chief Rabbi has authored dozens of books and frequently contributes to radio, television and national press. Chief Rabbi, we are truly honoured to have you here this evening. Your determination to fit us into ex your extremely busy schedule reflects your commitment to and support of B'nai Kiva. The relationship between us has been strong and rich, particularly in terms of your ideological support of our movement, acting as Honorary President of Friends of B'nai Kiva. We thank you for your continued support and hope that the close relationship will continue as you move on to your next, to your next venture. We wish we wish you much hatlacha. Please welcome Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs. So who am I speaking to? To the, the, everyone in Birmingham? Birmingham, Manchester, Birmingham, Birmingham, Manchester, and here. And here. What? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's shalom shalom to all of you in Birmingham, to all of you in here, I Kaddish, Manchester, and to uh, all the chavirim and chavirot in Auckland, which, as you know, is the place the Mashiach will arrive first. And that's their very special distinction. I have to say, B'nai Kiva has played such a part in keeping the Ruach of, uh, of Judaism and Jewish identity alive in New Zealand in a remarkable way. So my special congratulations to them. Uh, Birmingham and Manchester are real powerhouses, and I will never forget the uh, opening of uh, the Bayit in Manchester, which was one of the first things that I did in my chief ramanet. And there were a thousand people there and everyone was dancing around and there happened to be a journalist from the Independent who happened to be there and did this big article in the national press, having seen the Akiva dance around for the sake of her, saying now I know, this was a non-Jewish journalist, saying now I know what it was like to see King David bring the ark. And that was the impact that B'nai Kiva had on that non-Jewish journalist. But I think B'nai Kiva has given so much to British Jewry, to world Jewry, but in particular to British Jewry. You've been a constant source of inspiration from those ancient prehistoric days. When I was in B'nai Kiva, it was my tenua, uh to now, when you just lift the roof every Yomad Smaut, in Kinloss, and I will never forget how when he was Prime Minister, Gordon Brown invited himself, actually asked to be able to come to Yom Ha'atzmaut, and so loved the Ruach of your singing that uh, he continued to invite himself as long as he was Prime Minister, and that, that meant a great deal to me. You, you have that enthusiasm, that passion, that comes from deep, deep commitment to things that are incredibly important. And the combination of Torah and Avodah really is so important. So you bring a spirit of Eretz Yisrael to Chutz Laaret, while reminding us that this is still Chutz Laaret. We still have a way to go on the journey. So I thank you for the incredible contribution you've made to British Jewish life. I wish you brought Brachava Hatzlachal for the future and to say that you have truly inspired me. So let's learn something together, and since we're in the middle of Sefirat HaOma, let's learn about Sefirat HaOma and see whether there may not be a really important message here as far as the whole Hashkafa of Bnei Kiva and Tarava Voda religious Zionism, is concerned. And here we are. Let's just remind ourselves, source one. Sfatem lochem mi mocharata shabbat mi yom aviachem et ome ad nufa, sheva shabtot mi moti yena, ad mi mocharata shabbat hashvi, tis bruch amishim yom, etc. 
Now we have two fundamental questions. Number one, what actually is the role of this counting of days? What is the Tam HaMitzvah? And number two, as you know, there was a historical controversy with immense ramifications that arose out of differing interpretations of the words Imachorat HaShabbat. So let us first ask, uh, what is the logic of Sfirat Um Number one, um, I, I, I think I'm going to let you learn the sources yourselves, and I will, I will only look at some of them, and you can learn the Mikorot um, subsequently. But let us remind ourselves of the two different readings. Um, Actually, have a look. Can you see on the bottom foot of the page, Toldot Yitzchak? Yeah? That's Yitzchak. Karo, Usfatem. Let's look, learn inside, okay? Usfatem lochem imocharaz ha-shabaz miyem avirechem ezem and uvavu ha-shabaz miyem avirechem ezem. Hatam she-tziwa ha-kadosh baruch ul-yispor et ha-oma gives a very interesting reason. Mibnei she-kol ish Yisrael haya asuk b'katziya shel. Why did the why did people count the days specifically up to Shavuos and not up to Pesach or not up to Sukkot? The answer is Shavuot comes in the middle of a period in which people are very busy, and therefore they may just forget it. It's the way Mincha comes in the middle of the day. You're not going to forget Shachris. You're not going to get forget Marif, but you can be so preoccupied that you forget that time for Mincha has come. So, says the told Yitzchak, that is what was happening in the fields in Israel around Shavuos time. Because everyone was so preoccupied with bringing in the harvest, v'chol echad, v'chol echad b'grono, mufuzarim v'yishkechu aliyatam l'regel. And therefore, it was conceivable that they would forget that the time has come to go to Yerushalayim and to go there. For the regal. So that is the first reason given by the Toldot Yitzchak, which is that um, you might just you might just forget in the thick of the agricultural thing, in the time before there were newspapers, before there were radio, before there was television, before there was iPhone, if you can imagine such a time, and so nobody had uh, a standard reminder of what day and what date this actually is. Midrash Tamacher. Mashal echad sheya chavush bebet ha'asurim. Somebody is in prison. V'tzak l'melech la'adiro. And he cries out to the king to liberate him. Oma ha'melech la'adiro v'latet lo bito. Not only says the king, will I liberate you, I will actually make you part of my family. I have a nice marriage with daughter and I'm going to marry you to her, so you're going to become a prince. Well, obviously, v'ayamonev ha'olech ad bo ha'zman, Obviously, the prisoner is counting the days until that great moment. The Israelites were in prison in Egypt, and God not only said, I will liberate you, but I will also marry you with the Torah as a ketubah and Har Sinai, or the heavens. As our chupa. That, of course, is associated with who in the Middle Ages? Who gives this? This is the Rambam's explanation. In the, the, the Zohar gives a different explanation. Anyone know? Hmm? Can you turn to the next page? Can you see it at the top of the page? Usfatem lachem, Omru lachem letzad she yatsu, Hashem lispo, she yatsava Hashem lispo, sheva shabtut, va amru zal, and the sages in the Zohar said, ki letzad shayu betumat mitzrayim. They were steeped in the impurity of Egypt, varatza Hashem listafeg lehumazu, and God wanted to join himself to this people. Dambaka Mishpat Nidash Dinalispo Zain Nikiim 
It is like a woman who is Nida, who counts seven clean days, with Sibra She Yispru Zain Shavuot. And in the case of the people as a whole, God commanded them as a preparation for their wedding to count seven clean weeks when they would purify themselves. And admittedly, there it was seven days in the case of a Nidah, and here in the case of a nation it's seven weeks. But there are two differences. Number one, the Israelites were steeped in impurity to a very radical extent, not like a Nidah. And secondly, for a whole nation to purify itself takes longer than for an individual. So you have, on the one hand, the Rambam saying, you're counting the days to Har Sinai and Matan Torah, and the Zohar says you count the days of purification, as we say uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the in the Sidurim of Nusachari and Chasidim talk about purifying the Chesed Sheva Chesed or the, the, the 49 different Midot. Give me two other mitzvot in the Torah that, in, well, we've just had one of them, what, what's another count? that involves, what's another command that involves counting time? Gonna have it this week, in short. Yovel, counting the seven cycles of seven years to the Yovel. Now what is the difference between the counting seven days of the Nida and the counting seven times seven years for the Yovel? What's the difference in, in the direction of the count here? Yeah, exactly so. You know, when, when you're counting towards the Yovel, you're counting two. But when you're trying to distance yourself from impurity, you're counting from. So you see why the Zohar and the Rambam come up with their explanations, because according to the Rambam, Sphira Sa'ume is a counting two, like the Yovel. And according to the Zohar, it's a counting from, like uh, Nidah. Are you with me? So, the Rambam and the Zohar have that difference. One says it's counting from, one says it's counting to. But the Tzad HaShaveh Shebeneim is that both of them are predicated on the historical journey from Egypt to Sinai, from Yitziat Mitzrayim to Zman Matan Parotem. What is the only problem with that explanation according to the Torah itself? According to the Torah itself, is Shavuos described as Man Matan Torah No, it's not mentioned in the whole of Tanakh. So, this is the Rambam and the and the Zohar are both functioning on the basis of Torah Shabbat Peh, not Torah Shabbat. What does the Torah itself emphasize when it talks about Sfirah Yisrael? The harvest, exactly, the seasonal thing. And that's why the Toldot Yitzchak makes a great deal of sense. Lefi pshuto shel mikra. Yeah? Uh, because, you know, that's, you know, the Shvuris, unlike Pesach, which has clearly got a historical resonance, and Sukkot, as we said, on Shabbos in Shul, in Parshas Emma, Aman Yedu Dorotechem, Kibbutzukot Yoshavdi, etc., etc., so there the historical dimension is essential and it's stated explicitly in the Torah, but it stated explicitly in the case of Shavuos is only the agricultural dimension. And thus far that makes a lot of sense. And uh, can you just look back down at the um, Togot Yitzchak? Yeah? Can you see the line that begins Hazer? Six lines down? Yeah? tam Some give a different explanation. What is the tsar? They're very anxious in case something, God forbid, might happen that would damage the harvest. There's too little rain, or there's too much rain, or this year didn't they have a... Um, a plague of uh, Arba, of, of locusts that came up from Egypt. So these are the times, 
the critical time for a farmer is will the grain be okay during the harvest period and therefore everyone has has that on their mind kidita bepere kama de rosh Hashanah. and we find this in relation to other festivals Morris says mipnei ma omra torah aviu oma bepesach mipnei shea pesach zman tvuahu oma kadosh baruch wa akrivu lefanai oma bepesach kidei she tibarach lachem tvuah shebesadot and so on and so forth you know since uh, on on the Oma is brought uh, as a sign of the beginning of the barley harvest, um, we pray, we do Nisuch um, uh, on Sukkot, so that Bechag Haolam Nidon Alamayim, because rainfall for the year is determined that time. So we do these things throughout the wheat harvest. Uh, throughout the grain harvest, which begins with barley and ends with wheat, throughout that, we count the days in order to bring down Hashem's bracha on the Tavur. So, these are the two agricultural explanations that we count in order that the produce should be blessed, or in order that we should not forget the date, right? Um, etc., etc. Those are the reasons for Sphira's own. Now, the second question arose uh, as to the meaning of Mimacharat HaShabbat, which literally means Sunday. And of course, we know through Torah Shabbat Peh that it means, as you can see in the Targum, I brought it just there, Keta Yonatam, the, the second source, we understand Mimocharat HaShabbat meaning the day after the first day of Pesach. And we know that through Torah Shabbat. But the Tzedokim and the Baitusim, very similar little groups of Tzedek and Baitus, uh, both of whom were pre- uh, among the priestly circles in the Second Temple period, who did not agree with Torah Shabbat Peh, they read it literally as Mamach Horat Shabbat, meaning Sunday. And since you begin the count on Sunday, it means Shavuos always falls on a Sunday. Now, why would Hashem command that on Shavuos it should be a specific day of the week, whereas on Pesach and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's not on a specific day of the week, but a specific day of the month. Why is Shavuos different? Yeah? According to the Sadducees and the Bithusians. And here you'll see, if you turn on the second page, Gemara, second source, Talmud Bavli, Meseches Menachas, Shehayu Baitusim Omrim. The Bithusians, and as I say, they, they were also, the Sadducees had the same sheet, huh? They used to say, Atzeret Achaha Shabbat. Shavuos always falls on Sunday. Nidbalahem Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai took it on himself to challenge them. Vamalahem Shotim Minayin Lachem. He said, Fools, why do you have this idea? There was one elder who had the temerity to stand up to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and actually gave him a very good reason. He said, Moshe Rabbeinu, Ohev Yisrael haya. Moshe Rabbeinu had Rachmanus on Jews. What have they been doing? They've been laboring in the fields for seven weeks. They're completely exhausted. And he knew that you only get a little break for Shavuos. For Sukkot and for Pesach, you get a break of a week. You got a week's holiday. But on Shavuos, you only get a day's holiday. Ahmad v'tikna acha Shabbat k'day sheu Yisrael mitangim shnei yamim That was the invention of the long weekend. Moshe Rabbeinu gave them a long weekend. Shabbos Sunday, you get a long weekend. So that was the answer given by the by Fusians. What is what what reason would you give for saying that 
Chazal were right in saying the Mokhara the Shabbat means the day after the first day of Pesach? There are lots more special actually. Anyone got a good one? Well, can you see this uh, source here? That, that source. There, there is a little. There is a little. Um, there's a little extract there from Rav Zevin Zetzal's Hamoadim Ba'alacha, and you look it up. He gives you one. He get, there are many, many explanations. He gives you one characteristic, one from Chazal, one from the Rambam, and one from the Achronim. I think we're going to have a look just at the Rambam. Can you see that line that begins with a bit of a dash, a Rambam, halfway down that source? Yeah? The, this is what the Rambam says. Mm. That is, they learned according to the Torah Shabbal Peh, She'ena Shabbat Elayom That the meaning of Shabbat in the phrase Mimachurat Shabbat does not refer to Saturday, but to the first day of Pesach. V'chein ra'u tamid hanavi'im v'asan hedrim v'chol dovadam. And that is the tradition that they received Baalpe orally from Moshe Rabbeinu and handed it on through the Nevi'im and the Sanhedrin, generation after generation. They offered up the Oma on the 16th of Nisan, Ben Bechol, Ben Shabbat, regardless of when, which day of the week Pesach. Bahari Nema Batara, Velechem, the Kali, the Carmel, Lotahu, at Etzem Ayomazem. You are not allowed to eat of the new uh, crop until you've offered up the emma. Venema, and then it says in the book of Yoshua in the fifth chapter, Vayachlu me avoharetz mimachorat hapesach matzot v'kalu. In the fifth chapter of Joshua, when they cross the Jordan and enter the land, it says they ate of the new pro- promise, uh, new produce mimochorat ha-pesach and not mimochorat ha-shabbat. Right? So the Rambam says, you see here, the word Shabbat means Pesach. Yeah? And uh, etc. etc. Vim tamasheota Pesach the Shabbat era. Uh, he says the Bithusians would argue with you, why did they eat the day after Pesach? Because that year Pesach fell on a Shabbos. But the Rambam says, well, in that case, should have emphasized that it was on Shabbos, not on Pesach, because the Ica would be Pesach. Now that is the Rambam's proof, and have a little look here, can you see on the second page, halfway down? Oh, three down on the second page. Here is this moment. Vayachanu b'nei Yisrael b'gilgal, the Israelites under Joshua encamped in Gilgal, Vayasu et a Pesach, Barba is a Yemo Chodesh, Barab, Barvot Yericho. And they celebrated Pesach on the 14th of the month in the evening. They offered the Korban Pesach. Vayachu me avo haaretz, they ate of the produce of the land the next day. Pesach matzes with Kaloi beetzem a Yemoze, Vayishbos haman mimokarat bochlam, etc. And that next day the manna ceased. Okay? That is the straightforward explanation. What was Sphira Omer, the Rambam, the Zelha, it was counting the days from the Exodus to the Revelation of Sinai, and according to the Tozot Yitzchak, two agricultural explanations, and why does it say Mimokharat Shabbat? According to the Tzidokim, it was a long weekend, but according to the Rambam, we can see that the, the book of Joshua uses the phrase Mimokharat Pesach, the way it uses the phrase Mimoharat HaShabbat in Parshazim, right? And that is the standard explanation for both of us. Okay? And now let me suggest a completely and absolutely radically more reading this. Here we go. Number one. Why does the Torah say Mimoharat HaShabbat? 
Let me explain to you. Throughout, and I've got an obvious question, how come this became a controversy in the late Second Temple period? Are you with me? There, there was, it was more than a thousand years, 1,300 years, that they celebrated Shavuot from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu to the late Second Temple period. How come they never had an argument for it for over a thousand years? And all of a sudden, in the Bait Shani, they had an argument about it. Okay? See the question? I want to suggest a very simple answer. And a very simple explanation of why Mimachorat Shabbat means the day after the first day. And why this became controversial. And the answer is very simple. Because Pesach is unique. Pesach has two separate celebrations associated. Number one is called Pesach. When was Pesach in the biblical era? Let me tell you. When was Pesach the 14th of Nisan? Pesach was the day on which you offered up the Karban Pesach. Are you with me? That was the day. What we call Pesach today, which begins on the 15th of Nisan, what does the Torah call it? Chag he never calls it Pesach. Pesach is a different day completely. Pesach is the 14th of Nisan. Chag is the festival from the 15th to the 21st. Are you with me? These are completely different days. Pesach is one thing, and Chagam is a different thing. So what was the Torah supposed to say? Mimochorata Pesach, the day after Pesach, that's the 15th of Nisan, not the 16th. If it said Mimochorata Chag, that would be the 20, whatever it is, 22nd, 23rd of Nisan, not the 16th. Are you following? The Torah couldn't have said Mimocharat Pesach because that it, we'd get the wrong day, and it couldn't say Mimocharat Achad because we'd still get the wrong. Day. What is the difference between Pesach? I've got my marching orders. Okay. Uh, what is the difference between Pesach and Chagamatzot, guys? What's the difference? Chagamatzot, beginning and end. You can't work. There's a Yisur Malacha, right? It's Yom Tov. Whereas Pesach, the 15th, when you offer up the Karban Pesach, there's no Yisur Malacha, right? Are you with me? So therefore, if you want to say, in the simplest economical way, so that people will not get confused between Pesach and Chagam Atzot, you have to say, after the day of rest, Mimachorat HaShabbat. Because Pesach is not a Shabbos. Pesach is the 14th of Nisan. You can do work, you can write, you can buy and sell, you can do whatever you like. You offer up the Korban Pesach. There's no Isra Malacha. But the day of, first day of Pesach, there's Isra Malacha. You can't call it a Chag because the Chag lasts for seven days. You want to describe the first day, the day of Pesach. Therefore the Torah was absolutely clear and simple for anyone living in the biblical era. The trouble is, after the biblical era, we suddenly discover people calling Chagamatzot Pesach. What's the name of the tractate dealing with Pesach? Pesachim. Arve Pesachim. Arve Pesachim. Give everyone an offer. All of a sudden, Chagamatzot comes to be called Pesach. Or Pesachim. And all of a sudden, people get confused. Why does he say Mimocharat Shabbat and not Mimocharat Pesach? Because they forgot that Pesach, which to them is the seven-day festival beginning on the 15th of Nisan, in the biblical age meant the 14th of Nisan. So they only got confused when linguistic convention changed, of which we have the evidence that the Masechet dealing with the festival is called Psachim, Whereas it should have been called Chagamatzo. Because of that linguistic change, an ambiguity began which never existed in the biblical language. And that's why it was not a controversy throughout the whole biblical world. 
But in the post-biblical era, you know, you're saying now, oh, they could have taken a book and worked out the place that didn't have books. That's Farim. They didn't have the books to read. They couldn't look it up, so they didn't know. So when they heard, they wanted the day after the first day of the festival. How would we say, Mimachorat HaPesach? Because that's how you spoke in the first century uh, of BC, in the first century of CD. It's not how you spoke. You with me? So, that's number one. So now, sorry, I, I, if you, the simple, I, we just cut through about 2,000 years of argument, and now we understand. Now, I want to come with a radically different explanation of Sphere of Power. Tell me very simply, what else in the Torah is associated with the word Om? There's only one thing. What is it? Matter. Exactly so. Turn, open Shmot chapter 16, and you will see the word Alma appears six times. It's the only other place it appears. Always in connection with the manna. The manna fell, and however much you collected, or however little you collected, when you measured it up, it was an omer. Right? That's how much manna you got, except on Shabbos, when you got on Friday, two omers fell, etc., etc. Now, is it conceivable that Sfirat HaOmer has something to do with the manna? Well, what's Pesach got to do with it? It is Hamatzot. Pesach is about one kind of food. Lechamoni, the bread of affliction. When did they start eating the manna? Answer, when the matzah ran. So the manna was the food of freedom. It was the food of the journey. Are you with me? And that is what Sphira Daome is. It's a reminder that our ancestors ate the Ome, called the manna. Right? Now, tell me, when did the manna start falling? Which day of the week? Have a look on second page, middle of the page, Rashi. Anyone know how long the matzah lasted? How long does matzah last? Lasted 30 days. Okay, Rashi Shmoz Perik Tazan, the Chamisha Asayim Nisparash Ayim Shel Chaniyazu. That was the day when they encamped on the fifth, halfway through the journey of the Lafi Shabo, the Yom Kosa Chararasha, you'd see him in its rhyme, but it's a little Golomon. That's when all the matzahs they did brought with them out of Egypt ran out, and they needed the manna. The manu she'achlu mishirei abatzah mishirei amatzah shishim v'achad zudot. They ate it for thirty days, sixty-one meals. They yared lahem man b'shisha asa be'iyah, and manna first fell on the sixteenth of year. The yom rishon b'shavas haya and kedisa b'merim. The manna began falling on Sunday. And that is why we start counting the Omer on Sunday in, rem- in memory of the manna that fell down on Sunday. Okay? It's true, we could start counting the Omer in the middle, but since we're remembering the Exodus on Pesach and the journey through the wilderness on Shavuos, uh, the food they ate during the wilderness, which wasn't the bread of slavery and the bread of affliction, was the manna, Lechem and Right? And that, it seems to me, was the view of the Tzedokim, the Sadducees. Yeah? We count the Oma in memory of the miracle of the bread that fell from the Israelites. Min HaShemayim Lechem in Hashem. Yeah? Sfira da Oma is a daily recall of the bread. Why daily? Because it fell then. Yeah? And you, it only lasted for a day, except on Friday. Yeah? So if you stored it up, uh, for two days, by the time you woke on the second morning, it had gone. So it was day by day by day, and so we count day by day by day to remind us of it, which began for months. Right? However, the Rambam says no. We have to look at the book of Joshua. And there we see Numochar at the Pesach instead of Numochar at the Shabbat. Now have a look at that 
source from Joshua. Do you have it? Third line down, third one down on the second page. And the Israelites dwelt in Galgal, and they made the best. Pesach on the 14th, etc., etc., and they ate the produce of the land, Mimocharat Pesach, the day after the Pesach, on the 15th, they ate the produce of the land, Matzot Vukalui Beetzam Ayom Azer, Vayishbot Haman Mimocharat, and the day after that, the 16th of Nisan, the manna ceased. Me'avuharat Vloi, Od B'nai Yisrael Mon, V'yuchum Induvarat Eretz Kon. Are you with me? Now we see the view of the of Chazal. What do we celebrate on the 16th of Nisan? Not the day the manna first fell, but the day the manna stopped. And that is the dispute between the Tzedokim and the Purush. The Tzedokim remembered this is in memory of the manna that fell for our ancestors and for the Purushim this is in memory of the day the manna stopped. And what did we have instead? The bread of Eretz Israel. Right? Now what is the difference between the manna and the bread of Israel? Please explain to me the difference. Bread you grow on in a farm and, you know, not the bread you buy in the local shop. What's the difference between manna and bread that you actually grow? Can we count them, please? Just look. Yeah? Yeah, when it's given by God, the other you have to make by yourself. Number two, what does the Torah call manna? Lechem min ha shemayim. What is the bread from Eretz Yisrael? Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. One comes from heaven, one comes from down here. Num Difference three, the manna was miraculous. You know all the miracles associated with manna. The bread you grow in the land of Israel is not miraculous. And uh, according to Rabbi Akiva, and Lechem Avirim, it's described in the psalm. What does Rabbi Akiva say? Lechem She Malachi Hasharet Ochumata. This is the bread the angels eat. What was the uh, Omer from? What grain? barley, which is even bread that animals eat. So one's very holy and one's not at all. But what is the difference? One comes from God and one doesn't come from God. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you something very simple and you'll think about it. Bread that falls from heaven without your having to do anything at all to produce it is very miraculous. However, Jewish tradition called this bread Nahama de Kisufa. Anyone know what that means? Pardon? Yeah, the bread of Shem. Why? You get it without working. Somebody else gave it to you. You know, we say in the benching, the Nal Tatsri Cheno Shemel again, Loli Mei Mat Nat Bazavad on the Loli Deravazah. If you eat somebody else's bread that you didn't have to work for, that is shaming because you're dependent on somebody else's generosity. Therefore, the sages, no, not the sages, you see in very little print here, can you see in very little print, print that little bit there? Get a magnifying glass and you will see this is the chasm sofa who explains that the man was called Nama de Gizufa. It was the bread of shame. Yes, it was miraculous. But because the Israelites didn't have to work for it, they felt shame because they didn't have the dignity of having produced it itself. The Chas himself is the first person I could find who connects Mon, the manna, with Nama de Gizufa. However, the bread that you grow in Eretz Yisrael through your own hard work that is bread you eat with dignity. Why? Because when you, when you work for it, you have become HaKadosh Baruch Hu's partner in the work of creation. God gave us the land, but the Israelites produced the labor. God gave us the grain, but the Israelites sowed the seed. 
Hazorim b'dima barina yiktsora, when you sow in tears, you weep in joy. Why? Because, uh, what is it, uh, you know, yigiyah kapecha kitochal ashrecha v'tolach. Because when you eat of the labor of your own hands, you feel a sense of dignity. And now you begin to see the fundamental philosophical difference between the Sadducees on the one hand and the Pharisees on the other. The Sadducees, according to many theorists, were the well-off. They were the affluent. They were koanim in the Beit HaMikdash. They were in the circle of the court. They lived in urban environments. They mainly lived in Jerusalem. They were part of what we would call today the leisured class. They weren't interested in hard work. They were not working class people. They were aristocrats. And so for them, the holiest of holies is the manna, which comes direct from God without your having to produce anything about it. It was miraculous. It was heavenly. It was the bread the angels eat. But the Purushim, who were working class people, knew that dignity comes when you work the land. And when you grow food in the land and you're able, Baruch Hashem Yom Yom, to thank God every day for the ability to become His partner in His land through your work and through your conquest and through your Yishuv Haaretz, that gives you dignity. And that is why for the Purushim, the Omer was, the manna was what you recalled on the Omer and the manna first fell on a Sunday. But for the Prushim, what gave you dignity was the bread you grew yourself in the land of Israel. And we know the manna ceased on the 16th of Nisan, and that is when they began eating from the produce. Are you with me? It turns out that the argument between the Prushim and the Tzedokim is pretty similar to the argument between the Eda Haredit and the world of religious Zionism today. Which is holier? to be able to receive bread from heaven courtesy of the government without having to work? Or is it Torah va'avodah? Avodah means hard. The Ne'akiva believed that going back to the land, working the land, producing bread from the land in partnership with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He gave the land, we gave the labor, he gave the Eretz and we gave the Avodah, that was where dignity is. And that's what we celebrate on Sphira the Omer. The real freedom is not that you stop eating the bread of affliction and start eating the bread of, 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 of heaven. The real freedom is you stop having to work for somebody else and you start working for yourself, for your people, to build up the land, to build up the people, and to be the people of Hashem who despite the fact that they are engaged in Avodah, never forget the Torah that inspires them to do so. In which case, it turns out that the argument is completely different from any, any other account has been given. And it turns out to be absolutely to the core of the philosophy of the making. In case you thought nobody ever said such a thing, pishpashti umwatsati, and you will find that in the last source I've given you, the Svas Emes, the Midbar Shvuas, okay, you will find that the, the Svas Emes comes up with a very similar suggestion. I only discovered this a couple of days ago, but Baruch Shekivanti, he says that the Shte Halachem of Shvuot represents that combination of Lachem in Hashemayim and Lachem in Aretz, and he also uses the concept of Nahama de Kisufa, although he uses the language of the Yushalmi, which is the source of our concept, but not of the wording, yeah? Uh, can you see in the last source on the second page? Yeah? Sfaz Emes? Yeah? Second line down, Ladzman, Yipulatam. And can you see the next words? Deman da'achal de love delay, bahit lista kulebe. That is the Yushalmi's way of describing Nama to Kisufa. When you eat of bread that really belongs to somebody else, you're ashamed to eat. So that is the first indication of what the Kabbalists call Nama to Kisufa. So I hope I've explained to you now both why there was a dispute 
and secondly, what there was a dispute about. Friends, never, ever, ever doubt the validity, the continuing importance, and Dovka now, when the whole political configuration of the new government is trying to create a new partnership between the religious public and the secular public, never, ever doubt that the Hashkafa of B'nai Kiva is relevant to the spiritual challenge of Eretz Israel and Medina Israel, and today more than in a generation. Never was there a more fitting moment for us as religious Jews to go out to secular Jews who want to engage in dialogue and partnership. And let us take our commitment as Bogrim of Kiva to Torah and Avodah and understand that that is the challenge of Medina Israel. In Chutz Laaretz, we are working for others. That's why Chutz Laaretz is always a little bit like Mitzvah, even if it's quite comfortable. But in Israel, we are working for the sake of Ram Yisrael, Al Torah Yisrael. And it is that upper God that gives us our dignity May this be a great, great moment for the Hashkafa of the Rava Vada. May Hashem continue to bless you, and may you continue to be a blessing to all Israel. Rabbi, thank you for your kind words about B'nai Akiva and for inspiring us with such a B'nai Akiva understanding of the Omer, the differences between Matzah and Man, and a unique interpretation of Mafroket of the Tzedukim and Baitosim. The way that you presented this idea exemplifies the piercing and thoughtful way you approach Torah, which is something I hope we can all learn from. On Yom HaTzmaot, we wanted to pay tribute to you in front of the whole community. But now, in this more intimate environment, I, on behalf of B'nai Akiva, would like to thank you for such things that the people in this room especially appreciate. I'd like to thank you for your thought-provoking books, quotes from which appear all over our format from Akhane, for writing articles in our educational publications, for hosting and having close relationship with years of Maz, Maz Kiruyot and Shlechim, for visiting and addressing our participants in Israel on Hafshara, for visiting the Tanoa in London and Manchester, for visiting Shabbatot Harigun in Salford and Birmingham in recent years, and for all the times you have spoken in the Bayit, including Limud, the recording of Covenant and Conversation, and recording messages for Chavei Rim at Machaneh. You have said that you'll be going back into teaching when your tenure as chief rabbi ends. So we, on behalf of the last 22 years of B'nai Akiva Chavirim, would like to present you with a uniform, recognized all over the world as signifying one of the world's top educators. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you everyone for uh, coming to this special limud and we will now be governing Mariv.